Hello and welcome back to Mass Effect 2. Last time we explored some space and fought Eclipse on a forbidden world. And learned absolutely nothing as to why the Eclipse were there. Because all the data was encrypted. And in fact, it needs even more decryption to make it work and seemingly nobody has decrypted it. That's kind of weird. This is not actually part of any chain of assignments, even though you would think it would be. Uh, the one hint about it is that the ship that was in there was en route to the Dranix system, so you would think that the Dranix system would have something about it. It is in fact in the Krogan DMZ, so let's... Uh, figure that out. But first, the unread messages. The Syniad, thank you. From Captain Isin Mal Vas Idena. Commander Shepard, please accept my sincere appreciation for your efforts in locating the wreckage of the Syniad. That ship has a storied history with both the migrant fleet and Cerberus, and we're pleased to know that her wreckage can be salvaged by my people. In finding and stabilizing Lieutenant Forson, you have returned to the flotilla one of our newest and most honored heroes. Your efforts in furthering the Quarian search for a new homeworld will be remembered. Alright. Storied history with the migrant fleet and Cerberus. I thought that name was familiar from somewhere. This was part of Mass Effect Ascension. So that's quite interesting how that ties in. And then artifacts cataloged from Project Firewalker. The artifacts you gathered might give us a lead on a larger Prothean site. They have incredible value for historians and might be instrumental in building our understanding of the Prothean legacy. Excellent work in mitigating the Geth presence, Commander. We will keep you apprised of further Geth activity should it threaten mission integrity. Right, so they're happy to get more Prothean artifacts. We still have one Firewalker mission left, but that's for later. So first, let's finish exploring... Tassel. Ilium's immediate surroundings. And then head to the Krogan DMZ. Berigale. While not a classical hothouse world like Venus, Berigale is scarcely more hospitable. In addition to being closest to the star to sell, its core contains many radioactives and other heavy elements. These increase the heat of the planets and drive volcanism. Berigale's crust is too rigid for plate tectonics to function, and the planet will go through cycles in which the pressure builds to a massive supervolcanic eruption. These spew eject over thousands of kilometers, leave Caldera a hundred kilometers across, and spew enough molten material to repave entire continents. The last such event was 812,000 years ago. The current rate of outgassing from volcanic hotspots Suggests another will occur within the next 10 millennia. That is quite long though. So, not very hospitable indeed. Quite close. Very large. High pressure and warm. And high gravity too. Makes sense. Panolus, a fairly typical Venusian hothouse, Panolus seems almost tame compared to the violent volcanic outbursts of the inner world, Berigale. In contrast, Panolus is nearly inert, with no active volcanoes or plate tectonics. The most dramatic event in the last million years was the foundering of the Asari Aerostat research platform Alviusic in 2092 which fell after being holed by an improbably unlucky meteor. Most of the crew successfully reached escape capsules, but six were lost. The 
crash wreck of the platform now lies on the Creosit plane in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, that sounds very unfortunate. Okay, it's rather small. Very high pressure, that makes sense. Very high temperature because of that also makes sense. Low gravity because of small size. Okay, anything in the asteroid belt? Probably not, although that looks a bit like an asteroid that I can see. But no, nothing here. So then, next up is this gadget. Thale. Thale is a typical hydrogen-helium gas giant. Its complex system of rings is unstable, dating back only a few million years. They are thought to be the shattered remains of a comet. Well, certainly looks comet-like. <laughs> and Naxal is an ammonia-methane ice giant. Several smaller energy corporations shed out of the big market in the Fire Gateway system are attempting to develop a local helium-3 fuel mining infrastructure to service Ilium. The leading investor is the human corporation Eldfell Ashland Energy. Their efforts have been hampered by the extra-legal pressure the H3 cartels in the Fire system can bring to bear, from simple price undercuts to bureaucratic obstructions. Denied permits and constant health and safety inspections. <laughs> well, that's Ilium for you, indeed. Capital is the Eldfell Ashland Energy Krafla. Population 6700. Well, it makes sense to have industry to service Ilium for this. But apparently, they can also shuttle. Helium-3 from somewhere else. Alright, so let's just go to the Krogan DMZ and continue on with these two next. Aralak. So I have 400. Now that's not going to be enough to get there and there. Get more fuel and lose more credits, because of course. At least we are getting credits from the assignments during exploration. Well, that kind of looks like the star that the elusive man gazes into. The Class B Blue Giant Nith was once the most strategically valuable system within Krogan territory. Though far too hot for habitable planets, Nith emits thousands of times the energy of a main sequence star like Earth's Sol. With help from Solarian uplift teams, the Krogan constructed a chain of solar power collector stations in orbit around Nith. These vast arrays beamed power to part particle accelerators on the surface of Mantun, which manufactured antiproton fuel for warship thrusters. In the Krogan rebellions, the Spectre agents managed to get a virus into the computers of the solar power arrays. Every fifth array suddenly applied braking thrusters. The arrays behind them piled up, and all were reduced to wreckage. This has since dispersed into a relatively stable ring system. The Krogan never had the resources to rebuild the solar arrays, depriving them of their fleet's main fuel supply for the remainder of the war. The particle accelerators still exist on Mantoon, but have not been used in thousands of years. Hmm. So quite to Chankin as well. 
trace atmosphere. Far orbital distance, but the star is giant. Small radius. Very hot. Tulus, methane ammonia atmosphere, traps the blistering heat of Nith, driving dayside temperatures up over a thousand degrees. While some loads of useful metals are present, the planet's incredible heat makes mining impractical. Hmm. How do you extract and do mining? in what seems to be a gas giant, but is it really? No, it's not, because the radius is 5,000 kilometers. Huh? So I guess it's just the atmosphere that looks like that. Huh. Well. Alright. It's very far away, but still very, very warm. Low gravity, because low radius also. Along the day length. Alright. And the last planet is. There. Vard is a methane ammonia ice giant. Until the Krogan rebellions, it had a sizable helium 3 fuel refining infrastructure. Once the solar arrays orbiting Nith were destroyed, the constant flow of anti-proton tankers visiting the system disappeared. There was little point to maintaining the facilities, so they were shut down and abandoned. Today, the ancient stations are squatted by transients, criminals, and outcasts. Although few are safe for habitation, neither the Krogan nor the Council Demilitarization Enforcement Mission CDEM, patrols care if they take their chances. Right, population is about 2,000. Long orbital distance. Mm, yeah. Strange that this is an ice giant considering the huge output from the star. But we're done with this system. And next is the Dronic system that was mentioned in the last assignment. Let's see if there are any clues as to Eclipse's involvement. That looks interesting. Kelim is a tectonically inert rock with an atmosphere of Krypton, Xenon, and Argon. There are few valuable loads of light metal scattered across its surface, but these are difficult to find. Most were mined out in the years leading up to the Krogan rebellions. Yeah, sure is a rock. A warm rock. Close to the star. Dor is a conventional methane ammonia ice giant. It is the main fueling port in the Dronic Cluster gateway system. Pildea Station, the headquarters for patrol ships of the Council Demilitarization Enforcement Mission, lies at the trailing Lagrange point of Dor. The CDEM logs all ships passing through the Krogan Demilitarized Zone, and has the right to board and search them for contraband at any time for any reason. There are no exceptions. At points over the last two centuries, diplomatic incidents have been caused when the patrol frigates boarded an Atari ho Asari hospital ship, a Batarian diplomatic courier, and privately owned human tram freighters. These measures are provided for under the terms of the Krogan Armistice. While the Krogan were allowed to retain their government and personal weapons, any attempt to provide starship-mounted weapons to the clans on Tuchanka is punishable by law. Nearly a millennia after the war ended, the official penalty for smuggling prescribed weapons is still death by spacing. Population 7,300. CDM Garrison 1100, including patrol ship crews. Hmm. Straight there is an ice giant that is so close to the star. I 
guess the star is kind of tiny. Sarsgoth is a small ice dwarf with an eccentric orbit. During perigee, portions of its icy surface sublimate into a thin atmosphere of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, which quick quickly freeze again as it recedes into the outer reaches of the Dronex system. Really cold! And still not that far away from the star. Some atmosphere, but not much. Low gravity. Though it looks quite like a lot of atmosphere going on here when we zoom in. So all of these are individual planets, but we cannot actually access them. Interesting. Rothla. Once Rothla was a large ice dwarf with the statistics listed below. In the waning years of the Krogan rebellions, it was shattered into a field of debris by what is assumed to have been the test of an exotic weapon system. In the wake of the event, the planetoid was reduced to a relatively contained field of thousands of tiny moonlets rotating around one another, colliding and ricocheting. The method used to destroy the planetoid has never been deduced. The Krogan clan who performed the experiment apparently all died in the event. Ships that have traveled to the edge of the event's light cone observed a moment of extreme gravitational lensing around Rothla immediately before its breakup, but no other clues. A popular extranet meme put forward by Sari author Delce Orthissa insists that the Turians are covering up the existence of a Krogan superbiotic breed that was genetically engineered within Rothla. The CDEM enforces quarantine around the Rothla field, citing cases of amateur investigators whose ships came to grief in the debris field. Well, that's interesting. Out the distance... relatively far away for the star. The radius is small. Low pressure, very cold. Hmm. And yet they managed to do something with all these uh, weapon systems tests. It's quite scary to think of the Krogan being actually able to destroy entire planets. Finally, we have Aralak. Durak. Durak is a small, heat-blasted rock lost in the blinding glare of the star Aralak. It occasionally traps a trace atmosphere of gases blown in on Aralak's powerful solar wind, which inevitably blows the gases back out again. The planetoid has a few valuable loads of heavy metals, which were sporadically mined by the Krogan at the height of their power. In the closing years of the rebellions, the five clans working the planetoid fell to fighting over a particularly rich deposit of iridium. All five clan warlords agreed to a crush, a meeting at a neutral location, to negotiate a truce. Unfortunately, all five arrived planning to betray their fellows. While the leaders and their seconds met, all their bases were destroyed by simultaneous hypervelocity cannon strikes. Left with only the food, water, and air in their hard suits, and with no way to call for rescue, the warlords apparently fought each other to the death. The survivors of the five Drak clans on Tuchanka still argue about which clan's warlord was the last one standing. That's interesting. So it's just used for mining, otherwise not super interesting. Quite small indeed, very warm, low gravity. K 
Canin. One of Canin's hemispheres contains an impact crater 700 kilometers in diameter. Dubbed the Rankat Basin, it was mined for light metals in the interbellum between the Rachni War and Krogan Rebellions. Any obvious resource concentrations have long since been stripped. Right. Kruban is a tidally locked Venusian hothouse, its surface perpetually obscured by clouds of sulfur and carbon dioxide. The first group of Krogan, brought into orbit by the Salarian uplift teams, requested a trip to Kruban. The Salarians at first thought the Krogan were confused about the nature of Kruban's environment. The planet is named for Krogan mythological paradise, in which honorable warriors feast on the internal organs of their enemies. In fact, Krogan astronomers had correctly deduced the nature of Kruban in the years before the Global Holocaust. In the two millennia since, Kruban had come to be thought of as an ideal test of one's toughness. Every year, a few Krogan attempt to land on Kruban and exit their, sh exit their ships naked in an attempt to prove their Kroganhood. The planet's surface is littered with the crushed, corroded remains of their ships. Only one, Shalth Norda, is known to have returned from the surface alive, albeit with most of his bones crushed and all four of his lungs damaged by sulfuric gas. Norda recovered from his trial to the adulation of his people. Until he died in 1943, he could lie with any fertile female he wished. <laughs> that sounds kind of dumb and Krogan. <laughs> And it's relatively far away, but quite warm, small, high pressure, of course. So we have Tuchanka, and then we have Ruam. The smaller of Aralax hydrogen helium gas giants maintains a small helium-3 recovery infrastructure. Although the depth of Ruam's gravity well makes it inefficient to export, visitors to the airlock system often top off their fuel tanks at Ruam stations. The Council Demilitarization Enforcement Mission maintains a token garrison to monitor any potential sale of fuel to known subversives and terrorists. Hmm. Okay. Population is 1040. 20 people in the CDM garrison. And lastly, we have... Vol is a hydrogen-helium gas giant named for an ancient Krogan deity that stood watch for enemies of his pantheon. The gas giant's moons are named after some of Vol's myriad eyes and ears. The only reason to visit the Vol system is scientific curiosity, which the Krogan lack. <laughs> I mean, they do have plenty of scientific curiosity for things that explode. Not much beyond that, though. So we're done with the Krogan DMZ. Two more star systems remaining for exploration. Let's go to the Minos Wasteland. Hmm. Very small star system, but a lot of things in it. Also a very compact system. Case this. Home to dextroamino acid-based life, Invictus' temperate zones were settled by a Turian population that initially fell prey to a bewildering number of diseases. Two decades after its first colony was founded, its population had reduced by half due to fatalities and a large colonist exodus. Exodus? Yeah. But when the Primarchs considered ceding the planet's robo-mining interests, 
The Turian statesman Shastina Emperas ambitiously declared that she would start her own colony and double its population within five years. Hmm. This effort succeeded, largely due to the colony's location in deserts with a minimal number of pest species. The image of Shastina's triumph for in the frontier made for a good political theater, and the Turian population poured in. The planet's tropical belt still remains largely unexplored, as its aggressive organic life wreaks havoc on Turian biology. A house in Invictus jungle is a modern Turian phrase for an idea that seems like a good idea, but only to the one who came up with it. Invictus's atmosphere is primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Its surface crust varies, but has high concentrations of alumina and silver. Because it can support life easily, criminals from throughout the terminus systems hide out on Invictus. Its official population is estimated to be half the number of sapiens that are actually on the planet. Only found in 1939 CE, Population is 320 million, estimated 640 million with the legals. The capital is Shastinacio. Total distance 1.3, a bit far, but still reasonable. The radius is good, day length is good, pressure is good, temperature is good. High gravity though. And we also have Tamararus. Visible in Invictus Night Sky is Tamararus, a planet named for the Turian spirit, said to have inspired the crew of their first man moon launch. A boiling hot rock planet, Tamararus is much hotter than its temperate neighbor due to a thick atmosphere rich in carbon dioxide and helium. Its hot surface is largely composed of boron. Surrounded by a thick dust cloud, Tamararus is often struck by small meteors, making exploration dangerous. Yeah, that is quite warm, and that is a lot of atmospheric pressure. But it's small, so the gravity is low. Interesting to see a Turian system. You can see how the naming of Turian names is in line with the name Turian itself for Centurion. <laughs> Alright, back to the mass relay system. Let's see what we have here. A pressure cooker planet with a thick nitrogen heavy atmosphere. Vir is largely ignored by the galactic community. Probes have revealed a crust of nickel and scorched carbon, both of which can be found in abundance elsewhere, at far lesser temperatures. Yeah... That's not great. <laughs> and that's also not great. Quite large, though. Pietas. Though Pietas has a combination of features that make terraforming a possibility, the rights to the planet have been tied up in Citadel Council Courts for the past eight years. The running joke is that by the time the Council finally gives the go-ahead to colonize the planet, Pietas will have evolved to life of its own. Home to comfortable temperatures and a mild atmosphere of mostly nitrogen and argon, Pietas could be habitable with the addition of oxygen-producing cyanobacteria. Its crust is high in silicates and carbon, allowing for easy fabrication of construction materials. Smugglers, pirates, and other unregistered starships sometimes touch down on Pietas to lay low or make repairs. Civilian travel is not advised. Small, good day length, good atmosphere, Good temperature. A bit low gravity. Makes sense. <laughs> Anomaly detected. Echitus. 
Home to the famous Iron Canyons, Ekitas has reddish iron oxide dust, hematite, covering much of its surface, and significant blue cobalt deposits that freckle the terrain. Turian explorers have discovered hot springs in the polar ice caps, heated by magma in the planet's crust. In a strange combination of science and hucksterism, a small facility exports water from these springs, which is bottled and sold as having medicinal properties. The funds are then used to maintain a research station, which has discovered some fossil evidence that Echitus once harbored microscopic life, based on deoxyribonucleic acids in these springs. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> It is possible, though, that water from the springs would have medicinal properties. The question is, does it? <laughs> hmm. So this is hematite, and these things are cobalt. Far away. Good size. Low pressure. Cold. Relatively high gravity. Unregistered user or record damaged. Status is not known. Beacon triggered by universal distress protocol. Unregistered user or record damaged. Status is not known. Beacon triggered by universal distress protocol. Unregistered user. Scans have found something. Anomaly detected. Surface scans report potential alien signatures from within the mining facility. Anomalous life signs detected. Whereabouts of facility staff unknown. So we have an seven abandoned mine. Scans pick up strange alien signals coming from an apparently abandoned mine on the surface of planet Ekitas. The whereabouts of the mining facility staff are unknown. Land on the planet Ekitas and investigate strange readings from the abandoned mine. I think that is the last assignment that we need to do. And we will do so next time. See you all then. Later.